to Wellness Wednesday, a monthly series where experts share practical tips and techniques on topics that are important to patients, survivors, and caretakers alike. I'm Erin Kuhn Krieger with Rolf Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, and I'm so happy to be back moderating today's session where we have Chris Rosandich, the Nutrition and Wellness Program Manager at the Cancer Support Center, back with us to talk about the cancer fighting diet. You may remember our past conversations with Chris. We talked about the impact of sugar on our diets, the impact of, uh, or the importance of healthy digestion. And today we're gonna to be talking about some easy swaps that can make for a healthier lifestyle. Super excited to see all the tips that uh, Chris has for us. But first I wanna say thanks to everyone who is participating in our March Mania tournament. It's been a bracket busting tournament so far. Um, and I don't know if you're like me, but I hardly have any teams, possibly no teams left. Um, but there's still time to support Ralph's mission without the agony of busted brackets. You could simply click on the link that's in the chat and uh, donate to support what, uh, what we're working on every day. I also wanna give a big shout out and thank you to the students, teachers, faculty, and staff at Highland Park High School. Every, and everybody who participated in the Highland Park High School charity drive this year and all the events that surround it. In just four weeks, you raised $105,000 to support Ralph's efforts. How amazing is that? Speaking of special events, I want you to be sure to save the date for this year's Dash for Detection. It's taking place on Saturday, June 10th in, excuse me, in person at Montrose Harbor in Chicago. But don't worry if you can't make it to Chicago, we're also offering virtual options for the, for, uh, excuse me, dash at a distance anytime in June. Be sure to follow our social channels for updates on when registration will open and all events that are uh, gonna be part of that. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Don't forget you could ask questions throughout the session in the comment session below, or you could email us at info at ralphfoundation.org. We'll save all questions at the end just to make sure that we get to everybody. Christine Rosandich is the Nutrition and Pro Wellness Program Manager for the Cancer Support Center. Christine has a master's degree in health and nutrition education from Hawthorne <coughs> University and holds additional certifications, including plant-based nutrition from Cornell University and nutrition and cancer from Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. Welcome, Chris. We're so excited to have you back today. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks so much. I am excited about today because what we talked about in the last couple of programs was an anti-inflammatory diet. What does that look like? How to incorporate that into your uh, lifestyle? Uh, then we talked a little bit about digestion. And since 70 to 80% of your immune system resides in your uh, digestive tract, it's important that we look to see if there's any ways that we can improve on that. But then today is all about implementing some of these really new fun behaviors. So I'm going to jump right into my PowerPoint. You know, sharing a PowerPoint is just an easy way for us to stay on track. Um, and for all of you at home to be able to view uh, some of the slides and some of my um, pictures. So again, easy diet swaps for a healthier you. I've been at the Cancer Support Center for 16 years now. And I, it has just been a blessing, I tell you. It is that nonprofit psychosocial organization that provides the kind of support that people going through a cancer diagnosis needs or perhaps their families need. And so we have so many different areas and um, of service. We have counseling, we have wellness programs, we offer yoga and Zumba classes, we have a personal trainer, as the nutrition educator, I love to offer cooking demos, one-on-one -on -one trainings. We have a lot of counseling opportunities, free wigs. And I think our organization works so well with your organization, Erin, because we're helping the cancer patient or their family get through this really rough period in their life. So again, if anybody needs any uh, additional information, uh, we have two locations. And matter of fact, just this week, we experienced our 30th 30th year anniversary. So we're all excited down here and I'm excited to work with your organization as well. Remembering that I'm a nutrition educator and uh, please, any of this information, you know, talk with your healthcare professional. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, part one, which was really 
gosh, a year and a half or two years ago, we talked about chronic in inflammation. And we, and I love this quote. I'm just going to share a couple of slides um, with, with you that uh, chronic inflammatory diseases are the most significant cause of death in the world. I mean, who would think the World Health Organization ranks chronic disease as the greatest threat to human health? So looking at inflammation, how do we know we even have it? Many times it shows up in body or joint pain, chronic fatigue. I can't tell you how many times I talk about fatigue and, 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 and ways to increase your energy level, right? Sleep issue is a big um, concern of people going through a cancer diagnosis. Um, depression, anxiety, mood disorders, just digestive concerns like constipation, diarrhea, and acid reflux, as well as weight gain and weight loss and free, frequent infections. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just finished a, a little bit of a sinus infection, so I might cough um, a couple of times uh, throughout the program, so I apologize for that. But one of the, one of the, the research has really shown that sugar is, is a culprit. And so I love this quote. And, it, and if you would allow me to, I'd love to be able to read it to you. Sugar clogs nutrient channels, weakens bone and muscle, and slowing neural communication, which can impair mood and memory and lead to dementia. While all this is going on, sugar stiffens the collagen in your tendons, joints, and skin, causing arthritis and premature wrinkling while interfering with the production of new collagen throughout the body. And because sugar changes the surface markers, your white blood cells need to distinguish indigenous cells from invaders. It opens the door to cancer infection. And this quote from Catherine from Deep Nutrition is just an amazing look at some of the negative side effects that sugar does to our body. And so, I wanted to be able to remind us that we talked a lot about sugar the first time we met, but that sugar, um, there is finally a ceiling, or I, I should say a recommendation that you should not to go over a certain amount per day. And so for men, it's really nine teaspoons. For women, it's about six teaspoons. And why is that important? Because all the products we're purchasing at the grocery store have a label, unless of course they're fresh uh, without a label, but if it is a processed food, it's gonna have a label. And that nutrition facts label, it now shows that sugar, um, it breaks it down to total sugar and added sugar. And added sugar is the negative sugar because many times total sugar can include blueberries or different types of fruit, um, but it's the added sugar that we're looking to really decrease. And the reason I wanted to highlight this today, talking about an anti-inflammatory diet, is that we have to know that four grams of sugar equals a teaspoon. And so I want you to get the visual that really, if you're a woman, six teaspoons is about maximum that you want to take in for the day. That includes condiments like ketchup or relish. That includes bread pasta, there's sugar in everything, correct? So just really be mindful of, of how much sugar you are eating. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, your body can safely metabolize at least six teaspoons of added sugar per day. But since most Americans are consuming over three times that amount, majority of the excess sugar becomes metabolized into body fat, leading to all the debilitating chronic me metabolic diseases that many people struggle with. So I think looking at sugar as one of the true culprits of an inflammatory diet has to be um, you know, our focus when we're looking at making diet changes. And so what do we talk about that very first time we were together? An anti-inflammatory diet, which is whole foods. It's the foods that our ancestors ate. So really it's not, really that difficult. It, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not always easy to implement. So we're, we're striving to eat two or three servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I'd probably say even more like five or six servings, fruits and vegetables a day, small handful of nuts and seeds. 
but don't forget how powerful seeds are. You know, like your flax seeds, you can add those to the blender each day or every other day. Whole grains like quinoa or brown rice, beans and legumes filled with fiber, and then healthy fats. I think for years, I would say decades, we were demonizing fat, but we have to get back to olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, walnuts, right? Avocados, all of the foods and ingredients that have those healthy fats in it. Spices and herbs, lean meats, fish, natural sweeteners and beverages. So, and then what's opposite of an anti-inflammatory diet is really processed foods, processed grains, sugar. So really today's discussion, the foundation is right here. It's an anti-inflammatory diet. It's the way that our ancestors ate. And it's acknowledging that these manufacturers tried to encourage us to eat more processed foods and pre-made meals, thinking it would save us time, save us energy, they would help. But really it's just made our nation sicker. So the second conversation we had was about healthy digestion. And I just wanna highlight two or three really key parts. And if you have an unhealthy digestive tract or you have problems, side effects, symptoms from maybe treatment, um, and you're battling with constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux, burping, just anything to do with digestive wellness, I, I, I want you to maybe become a student of digestive wellness. It's that important. So we understand the connection between sugar, which is very inflammatory, leads to inflammation in our body, which does affect digestive wellness and can lead to disease. So there is that connection. And we do know that disease begins in the gut. So we talked about that in part two. And I just want to take a moment and remind you that if you were to lay out your digestive system, it would cover a tennis court. I mean, that's, that's, that's how broad it is. It's roughly 70 to 80% of our immune system uh, nestled inside your gut are trillions of live microorganisms that make up the microbiome. And you have a hundred times more DNA in your microbiome than you have cells in your body. So it's important. Gut bacteria helps to make vitamins, protect you against infection and run your metabolism. And the digestive system many times is called the second brain. That's how important it is. <laughs> and then 80 to 90% of serotonin is made in the gut. I think this is an important part because if you're dealing with anxiety, depression, uh, if you just have those days that you're feeling blue, understand that that serotonin that gives us that little bit of a lift is created in the gut. So again, it's foundational to look at your gut health. And so what are some of the benefits? We all want to have, we all want to be healthy. Uh, we want to have energy. We want to have balanced hormones, improve digestion, clear skin, mental clarity. So uh, I, I hope that I'm highlighting the importance of digestive wellness. And, and if you missed our last conversation, um, you're always welcome to reach out to me. We can have a conversation about digestive wellness or you become a student through you know, the internet or books available because you are what you eat, but you are what you digest, okay? And then we highlighted fermented foods and many parts of the world have eaten fermented foods forever, but not so much in the United States or at least for some people. And so looking at one quarter cup of a fermented food, maybe once a day, it, it, that would be a recommendation. Now, of course, it depends on your health, your digestive wellness, but maybe having a little bit of sauerkraut on a, um, a sandwich or maybe a, a, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar mixed in with a little bit of water. Uh, if you like kombucha or sourdough bread or yogurt in terms of 
some of the options. I know when I go to an Asian restaurant, I love to order miso soup and it's super easy to make. I mean, super easy. So you can look on the internet for a recipe for that. And these are just a couple of visuals. And I just want to share with you today that A, I'm so excited to be with you, but B, I have a lot of pictures because I think pictures really tell the story. And when we're talking about implementing some of these changes into your lifestyle, into your diet, what better way to tell a story than through pictures? Um, but here are some of the fermented foods that, again, we have to really be focused on. And you don't have to eat a lot of it and you don't have to eat it often, but you do need to incorporate these into your diet. And if you're not really a fan of fermented foods, you can always take a probiotic, um, you know, looking at that as an option. All right. So today, part three, easy diet swaps for a healthier you. And we're going to touch on four different areas. Why is it so hard to make healthy changes to your diet? Number two, two reasons why healthy cha lifestyle changes fail. Three, healthy ingredient swaps for a healthier you. And four, how to make sweet and salty treats healthier. Who doesn't want that, right? At seven at night, when you're sitting there, maybe watching a show, you just want something sweet. You worked hard. Uh, you just feel maybe a little bit emotionally drained and you just want kind of that culinary hug, right? Maybe not with a soup, but maybe with a sweet treat. So let's go ahead and dive into some of these areas. The first area is uh, looking at why is it so hard to make healthy changes to your diet? Well, I just thought it would be interesting to talk about barriers. Why is some person, some people, you know, they're just a little bit more resistant to making changes to their diet? You know, why are there those people, and it might be you, but you're like, I don't want to really eat really healthy all the time. It's just, you're, you're just a little bit resistant to it. Why? So number one would be lack of time. I think we have to really be honest and identify that many of us are very, very bu busy. Um, and, and our day should be filled with things that we want to do, people that we need to serve, people that we want to serve, uh, fun activities, but we do need to have a plan for healthy eating. Um, keep a list of quick, healthy meals and snacks available. One of the ideas I love is a journal. It could just be if you want to go to Hobby Lobby or go to the dollar bill store and, you know, get yourself a small journal and start to jot down what do I want to eat this week? What, what am I hungry for? What is my family talking about? What should we have for Friday night dinner? Um, also, shop for groceries online, and that is becoming more popular. If it's not in your budget to have them deliver it, go ahead and just have the groceries ready for pickup. You go, you let them know that you'll be there, and sure enough, it, it, they walk it right out to your car. So that's an easy way to be able to eat healthier. You might be feeling overwhelmed. You, you just, you're just feeling like, oh, I just don't have the energy right now to think about eating healthy. But I encourage you to just make very small changes. You might just start with breakfast. Get rid of that maybe cereal that doesn't have a lot of fiber in it. It's got maybe some, you know, crappier ingredients. Forgive me for using that word, but that's essentially what it is. You know, maybe put that cereal aside and think, okay, what, what are some healthier options for breakfast that I could at least start my day that way? Um, also feeling overwhelmed. Some people don't start their day uh, by eating a meal until two or three in the afternoon and your blood sugar is low. And that's no way to start the day. That's a good way to feel overwhelmed as well. An all or nothing attitude. Is that you? An all or nothing attitude? So changing your eating habits is not about perfection. It's about progress. And I just love that uh, statement. It, it really is about progress. And every good decision you make, just it just adds on to the next good decision. And if you find that you start to eat poorly, you start to eat out more, you're eating more processed foods, it's all right. The key, are you ready for the key? Is to jump, get back on that horse. Just get back on that horse. 
You don't want two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks to go by. If you have a couple of days of eating poorly, and how do I define poorly? That would be more processed foods, eating out, fast food, those type of foods. If you find that you're eating those type of foods day after day, just make a decision and think, okay, I just got to get back on that horse and I'm going to start with a good breakfast. The other concept that I really love to talk about is 80-20. And we've talked about it before, but if you weren't with me, I'd love to remind you of what this principle is. And I live by it. You know, I remember back um, just a few years ago <laughs> when I was in college, I put on a few pounds and I just felt that all or nothing. If I ate a sweet treat, if I grabbed something that I thought wasn't healthy, I felt like I just blew it. And I felt I would consistently say to myself, I'll start tomorrow. I'll just start tomorrow. I'll just eat healthy tomorrow. It was always about tomorrow. And if that is you, I would love for you to put that aside, understand that it's not perfection, it's progress, and to incorporate this concept that 80-20, 80% of the time you're eating whole foods, like our ancestors ate, these, these beautiful green vegetables, fruits and veggies, whole grains, apples, chicken breast, eggs, all of the real food that we know is whole and good and real. And then 20% of the time you can enjoy a treat. So that is a wonderful way to be able to eliminate uh, feeling deprived, which is one of the bullet points on this slide. You wanna eat a variety of foods, you wanna feel full, but you don't wanna feel deprived. And so who wants to go day after day without eating a treat? I, I don't even know that person. But um, I, for myself, need to know that I can have a couple of treats a day. So that 80-20 principle is really important. And if you find that some days, when you look at your plate, and if you notice that half the food is maybe not really wholesome and, and healthy, for example, let's say you go to a fast food place and get a hamburger, and it's a white bun, and there's French fries. I mean, all of those options are not healthy. But you grab some hummus and some gluten-free crackers. You know, at least there's something on the plate that's healthy. So even if you're eating 50-50, 50% of the food throughout the day is healthy, that's better than 80-20 in reverse, right? Uh, diet confusion is another barrier. What do I eat? I hear that from so many people. And um, it's important to know that eating an anti-inflammatory diet like our ancestors ate, real food, it's super, it's simple, not easy, but it's simple. Um, and I love the definition of diet. Did I eat today? I love that. Get rid of diets. Oh my gosh. The only, you know, I don't know anyone that really, you, all right, I'm just going to say some people do well in a diet because they learn to um, manage, um, manage what they're eating and look at portion control. Uh, sometimes it helps to have really options all defined for you. But many people, when you get off the diet, then you start eating like you used to. So we want it to be a lifestyle change, right? And then muscle memory would be the last barrier. What does that mean, Chris? Well, it means you probably remember what it felt like to eat well, and you just don't want to go back there. You know, it's kind of painful. You had to give up all your sweet treats and it's like, oh, I don't want that again. So that muscle memory, that negative muscle memory, um, but we can, we can change that and create some positive memories for you. And so we need to swap behaviors. We were talking about swapping ingredients. We need to swap some behaviors. So in terms of time, maybe purchase some pre-cut produce. Um, there's many options now. Maybe put some food in a slow cooker and that can make cooking for you and your family easier so that when you walk in the door at five or six in the evening, it's fairly ready to go. And then maybe make, when you do cook, uh, double up on the recipes so that you have leftovers. In terms of feeling overwhelmed, just be, just think about being prepared. And again, I, it's not about perfection, but maybe make overnight oatmeal, maybe make a 12 hard boiled eggs. So everybody has an egg or two to, to grab and go, 
right? You can just grab a hard boiled egg with an orange or a banana and there's your breakfast. Uh, maybe prep a smoothie ahead of time. So you get all of the ingredients, all the fruits and vegetables out when you have the time and, and put those in individual plastic containers and put those in the freezer. So you can just grab them the night before, put them in the refridge and you're ready for the next day to blend them up. And then uh, yogurt, even though it's not spelt like that, uh, but yogurt is sometimes easy to grab and go. And then eat leftovers for lunch. That's super easy. You don't have to think about lunch, just eat leftovers. And then purchase a good insulated lunch bag. So you always have an insulated lunch bag in your car, in your office, so that you can put snacks and treats that are healthy options. Um, I think deprivation kind of goes hand in hand with diet. And, and that's something we don't want to live by. That's why this is a lifestyle strategy. We, we don't want to feel hungry. You want to eat fiber, right? You want to eat whole grain. You want to eat three full meals. Do you know how many people I talk to that graze during the day? And so they never feel really full. Uh, they just feel like every hour or so, they're just kind of snacking. So really the encouragement is to, unless you're on treatment and you can't eat three full meals, you might need to eat five or six small meals. But for most of us, just eat three good meals and you sit down and you enjoy it and you take the time and you have a healthy protein, you have a healthy fat and you have some fruits and vegetables, you know, whole grains, whatever it might be. Okay, so we want to address the second question uh, or statement here, two reasons why healthy lifestyles change. And yesterday I had the opportunity to teach about uh, behavior change. And I just wanted to introduce you to two concepts. And one is really written by um, a wonderful author. His name is James Clear. And if you're interested in behavior change, uh, it might be a book, Atomic Habits, that you invest in, or they might have it at the library. And so he talks about outcomes, processes, and identity. The reason I feel like this is like a, an aha moment is because the outcome is kind of the goal what you get or what you want, right? The processes, he calls them systems. And it's all about what you do. How do you get to that goal? It's, that's the most important part. How do you get to that goal? How do you get to achieve that goal? And then the third part is identity, is about what you believe and who you want to become. So we, we know a lot about goals. Let's say you wanna lose 20 pounds or let's even make it more simple you want to read more. Um, the processes or this, I like to call it systems, and so does he. It would be, first of all, you have to have a book, right? And the, the system would be, you would put the book it, on your end table. So it'd be, you could, you could see it, uh, it it's available. Um, it, it's right there. I mean, could you imagine a home that doesn't have any books at all? You're not going to read much, right? So you need to set up your system for success. But here's the key. The key is your identity. If, are you a reader? If you are a reader, or if you want to become a reader and you're not currently a reader, but you don't see yourself as a reader, that goal is not going to stick for long. You need to be able to see yourself as that person. So for example, if you want to exercise, let's say you want to walk every day for a half hour, three or four days a week, but you really don't see yourself as a walker or an exerciser or somebody's healthy that does that kind of activity, after about the fourth day, you're probably going to give up on it. So you need to be able to see yourself as that person. I'm a walker. Oh my gosh, of course I have to walk today. I'm a walker. You know, of course I'm a healthy eater. Uh, you know, of course I'm a, I, I want to make a meal for my family. I love to cook. I'm a cook. Um, so it's, it's looking at not only goals, which is outcomes, but it's looking at systems and identity. Also, you want to look at, uh, cues or we call them triggers, the actual behavior and then the reward. So in order to achieve a goal or create a new habit, you have to look at the triggers. And I just want to spend just one minute talking about it. We have triggers in our life. Um, all day long. Triggers, I mean, for example, when the alarm goes off, that's a trigger to get up. 
uh, when you see your toothbrush laying there on the sink, that's a trigger to brush your teeth. When you, you know, see the coffee pot, that's a trigger to make yourself coffee. So we see triggers all of the time. And it's important to understand that the triggers are really critical in creating a new behavior. And then of course, we understand that reward. You've got to reward your system, your, yourself. Uh, like if you're training a dog to sit, it's interesting. You, the behavior is sitting, the trigger would be your hand would be lifted and you would want their little derriere to go to the floor. And then immediately you would give them a dog bone within two seconds. A dog needs a reward within two seconds. Do you know how long um, or how important it is to give a human a reward? How fast? How fast do we need to give a human a reward after they do a behavior? About two minutes. We're not far from a dog, right? So we really need to be rewarded in a positive way in order to make that habit stick. So habits are the evidence you see that you are becoming a different person. Um, and if, if, you are if you're recognizing that you set goals and you're not achieving those goals, perhaps in terms of the conversation today, you want to eat healthy, but for whatever reason you're not, I want you to think about, first of all, your system. Do you have a lot of healthy food in your house? When you come home at four o'clock, do you have healthy options to grab? Or are they all just like chips in the pantry? Do you have good systems in place? If you want to exercise more, do you have a good pair of tennis shoes? That's essentially your system. And, and the cue would be put those tennis shoes right by the door, right? You're like, you look at those tennis shoes and you think, oh my gosh, I need to exercise. So that would be number one, but also identify, are you rewarding yourself in a positive way? Um, and, and not just with food. It, it, it could be in other ways, um, but you know, not only setting the goal, but looking at the trigger. Okay, so as we move forward, I wanna answer these questions, healthy ingredient swaps for a healthier you and how to make sweet, salty treats healthier. Okay, so are you ready? We're gonna have some fun with this segment and really get you excited. My hope is <laughs> that I get you excited about cooking more at home. Because, you know, I could fib and say that you could eat 100% out and be healthy. I suppose you could. Uh, I, I couldn't even imagine the, the money that you would need to spend, the budget you would need to have in order to succeed eating out 100% of the time. So today I'm hopeful that I get you excited about, all right, I, I've got to be able to cook at home prep at home, start to eat some of these healthier options um, at home and bring them with me to the office. And so really the goal is, is just that. So we're gonna start with breakfast and I hope you're excited to see this slide because it's, and if you can, if you're listening to a pod, this on a podcast, um, and, and you're driving and you can't see the slide. I've got pictures of healthy breakfast. So I'll just go through a few. And I'll tell you, I am a fan of pancakes. I just can't give that up. It is a, a memory of when I was growing up. Now that I'm an adult, uh, I can't eat or I should not consume gluten because I have a gluten intolerance. I, I don't have celiacs, but I understand that when I eat wheat, I have a tendency, my digestive tract has a tendency to start to um, get inflated, become inflamed. I get, you know, maybe I experience acid reflux, all of these uncomfortable symptoms. And so I buy gluten-free pancakes and I love to make those for my grandbabies. And, uh, but if that isn't you, just maybe looking to buy whole wheat pancakes, an option, um, even though they might come out of a box, they might be a little healthier than if you're ordering those at a restaurant because of the oil that you're about to use to cook those pancakes. Remember, it's the ingredients that you use that make things healthier. So you might be using a really high grade olive oil or coconut oil. Um, you might be using a um, free range egg instead of cage free. Um, 
Also, some of the options I have here is yogurt. And remember, not all yogurt is equal. Some have more sugar than others. But if you buy a unsweetened Greek yogurt, and then you add maybe a, a better gray granola or blueberries, maybe make your own muffins at home, adding maybe perhaps blueberry, pumpkin, nuts and seeds, oatmeal. Everything is about ingredients. And when you're cooking at home, you can control those ingredients. So choosing to eat really healthy breakfast is an amazing start of your day. Um, and one other option would be quinoa. Quinoa is actually a seed and it, you make it just like rice. Make sure that you rinse it off really thoroughly before you do cook it, but you don't have to make it savory. You can make it a little bit sweet. And so you would add pecans, blueberries, a drizzle of maple syrup, and it makes for a really nice alternative to oatmeal in the morning. Also, maybe a breakfast burrito. And these are things you can do the night before to make life a little bit easier. How many people stop for a breakfast burrito at certain restaurants, right? Or fast food places while you're getting your coffee? Super easy to make your own at home. Uh, if you're going to make eggs, if you can add some greens, onions, uh, garlic, anything you can saute to make those eggs a little healthier, to incorporate more fiber, to incorporate healthier ingredients. Also on this page are those little wonderful like cheese and broccoli bites. You can make a tray of 12 of them and just have them in the refrigerator ready to go. And that makes for a great breakfast. Again, we talked about smoothies. You, you can um, maybe do avocado toast or just fill an avocado with an egg uh, or a drizzle of sriracha. <clears throat> Next, I wanna talk a little bit about meal preparation. So I, I just wanna, if I could, encourage you to think about cooking more for your family in 2023. Many of us are, are busy. We're taking care of perhaps young kids, older, the older generation. Uh, you know, we've got all these social commitments, uh, but cooking at home can be simple. And I want to show you an easy way to do it. And one, one thought process that I have, if you eat meat, if you eat turkey, poultry, um, red meat, whatever it might be, venison, bison, cooking the protein takes more time than the sides. Would you agree? I don't think it takes much time to steam broccoli or throw roasted veggies into the oven, but it does take a little bit of time to cook the protein. And so if you think ahead, let's say you decide, all right, this week, I'm going to buy a fairly lean ground turkey. And what could I do with that? And let's say on Sunday or a Saturday afternoon, or maybe perhaps a Tuesday night, if you've got the time and you have the energy, what do you do with that turkey? For me, many times I'll buy two pounds and I might take a um, one pound and make turkey, turkey burgers. And it's a great anti-inflammatory diet option because you get rid of that white bun and serve it with salad or some shredded um, cabbage or sauerkraut, or you can make, you kind of saute that meat and turn it into taco meat or meat for perhaps a, a taco salad. Maybe you take that turkey meat, or if it's venison, you go ahead with that same concept, but you're making you're 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 going to saute it or uh, you know cook it with a little bit of onions and garlic, adding um, the tomato sauce and making a, a spaghetti sauce ready to go, so that when you cook meat, you know I'm I'm stumbling here, but what I want to say is in terms of sanitation, you have to cook raw meat within a day or two. You always have to look at that label and make sure you're cooking that appropriately based on the date, um, the expiration date. 
But once it's cooked, you have really four to six days, possibly seven days, depending on your health. Uh, if you're going through chemo, you have to be a little bit more cautious. Uh, but most times after meat is cooked, you have five, six days to eat that. And so now you have this beautiful turkey spaghetti sauce ready to go for at least three or four days, right? Or you can make a meatloaf at the same time. And this slide just talks about how to, if you want, maybe buying an organic tomato sauce out of a jar, but making it more healthy. So sauteing in olive oil, um, some garlic and onions and mushrooms and peppers, whatever you like. But if many times, and if you don't like it chunky, you actually can puree some of these ingredients. So you don't even know that they're in the spaghetti sauce. All right, another really wonderful option with that spaghetti sauce, instead of doing pasta, are you a pasta fan? <laughs> are you, is your go-to pasta? You can look at quinoa pasta, or you can look at rice, maybe black bean pasta. There are other options, but sometimes you have to, you have to grocery shop at a unique store that offers you variety. Uh, one of my favorite things is buying a, a spaghetti squash. You literally cut it in half, drizzle with olive oil, put it in the oven. And when you take it out of the oven, you take a, a spoon or fork. And as, as it unfolds onto the, the bowl or the plate, it, it looks like pasta. And it's a wonderful alternative to white pasta that's more inflammatory. And then what about buying um, a, a little gadget? And so now you can uh, use a zucchini and, and add that to your spaghetti squash. So you simply make your shopping list and, and you're, you're ready to go with two or three of those meals. Easy peasy, you can make it at one time and you have three or four meals for the week. Now, let's say you look at week two and you think, okay, now you can mix it up, but these are just examples. What about week two? And you think, okay, fish. Um, I, I wanna be able to serve the family fish once or twice for the week. My favorite way to do it is buy fish that is individually or uh, seal wrapped so that when you have it in the freezer, you just grab two fillets, one fillet, four fillets. You take it out of that saran or that shrink wrap you can put it directly in the oven or while it's still in that shrink wrap, you put it in the, the sink and let it thaw just for about 20 minutes. And then you can add a topping. But I also love to buy um, wild salmon in the packets because boy, there's a, a long shelf life and it, it goes really, really well with salmon patties. And if you haven't made salmon patties in a while, they're wonderful because you, they've got breadcrumbs in them, a little bit of lemon. I love dill personally, or you could do dried basil. So, and you just do it right stovetop or put it in the oven, or then you grill your, your salmon. So just easy peasy. These are really super easy recipes, but if you're, if you're listening to me today and, and you're thinking, oh, that just still feels difficult. I want to encourage you to take a moment and listen to what you're saying to yourself because self-talk is critical in achieving new habits. There's a tendency, what we have a tendency to do is if we don't achieve a goal, or let's say you set the goal to, I wanna cook three dinners this week or for the month of April. And, and you know by the second week, you really haven't cooked, but maybe one meal and, and you're frustrated with yourself, but that self-talk perpetuates itself. And it's almost like muscle memory. You know, you're, you're, why didn't I do it? I'm not organized. I don't have the willpower, you know, and, and you kind of remember that. So when you go to cook, you remember those negative thoughts. It stays with you. So change that thought process, change how you talk to yourself and think, no, I can make a couple of easy dishes for the week. I absolutely can do that. And I also think you can incorporate family. I think it has to be a family um, effort. I know that when I was working and raising my family, out of the three adult children I have now, two love, love, love to cook. They're great cooks. Um, and, and the other one is on her way, but she's busy having children. She's got small children and works full time. But teaching our junior high, high school kids 
to cook, I think is a skill that will do them well for, throughout their life. Now, if you're super busy, I'm not a fan of rotisserie chicken, but because of the sodium level, sometimes you need to buy it. Sometimes that makes a difference. Um, you can, one of my favorite chickens is a uh, Miller chicken. You can find it at different grocery stores, but it's an Amish chicken. It's a little cleaner. You can find it not as costly as other chicken, but that is one of the chicken, the go-to brands that I go to. And I also love chicken thighs because they're inexpensive and you can do a lot with them. Um, and so just by having a rotisserie chicken, you can make chicken a la king. I mean, just go online and look up a recipe. You don't even have to have it on that beautiful biscuit that it's served on. You could do it on bread or something else. Uh, chicken pot pie, chicken salad, a lot of options. When you have chicken in the house, there's a lot of things you can do with it. And then I want to shift to plant-based meals because in, in terms of a cancer-fighting diet, we don't want to eat the, per, the majority of our diet in terms of animal protein. You want to really minimize that. You don't want that to be the, the, the main event for the plate. You want it to be kind of a side a side feature. What do I mean by that? You know, like if you're looking at this uh, screen to the top right corner, that's chili. Well, if you make chili with brown chicken or you make it with venison, um, you make it with maybe grass-fed beef, but you make it with one pound of the meat and then you add three cans of beans. You add all kinds of chopped veggies. You add avocado on the top. So you're, you're having this beautiful, you know, bowl of chili with a little animal protein, but it's not a seven ounce steak. You know what I mean? Um, but to go back to plant-based meals, you wouldn't add any animal protein to that. And, and that makes, for, I mean, after the second bite, you, you don't even think about the animal protein in that chili. Um, you can find raviolis, even though raviolis are processed, Remember, we talked about that spaghetti sauce, and you can add a lot of nutrient density to that sauce. You can make your family a panini, and that's a great way. Whole grain bread, maybe um, adding some cut up veggies, adding some sauerkraut. You can do uh, baked eggplants, or you can stuff peppers with quinoa or lentils. So, so many options. And then I just want to spend a few minutes talking about sides because this is where life gets easy. I love sides. Oh my gosh, we can eat sides all day and they're super easy even after a busy day at the office or if you're a stay-at-home mom and you're busy with small children, if you're older, if you're a cancer uh, survivor and you don't have much energy, you can literally sit down and clean and prep sweet potatoes, beets, onions, do a little bit of chopping with olive oil and just throw them in the oven. You can just walk away and then after 20 minutes or a half hour, come back and there is your roasted asparagus. I love sweet potatoes because they're just so good for us, high in fiber, and you can do so much with them. Also, again, this hopefully this presentation is just prompting you to think, oh my gosh, yes, I used to make some of these wonderful salads. It doesn't always have to be just about a green salad. I could make a quinoa salad. I could, I could make, you know, uh, a corn salad with black beans and uh, uh, what am I thinking of? Um, cilantro uh, with chopped peppers. There's so many things that you can do um, that put it together, have it in the refrigerator. This would make a fabulous lunch. One of my favorite things to do too is just you, again, can buy a bag of already chopped cabbage. That's super easy, but cabbage is easy to shred, right? You just buy a small red cabbage, shred it. I love to shred carrots because sometimes you don't want that big chunk of carrot in your mouth. And um, so anyway, just, just think about texture. Think about Sometimes maybe it's how our moms and dads or grandmothers made broccoli for us as we were growing up. And we, we remember it's that muscle memory. We don't like it, but how you cook broccoli can make all the difference with red pepper flake and you're only steaming it for two or three minutes. Okay. Soups are 
fabulous because they stay in the refrigerator for a while. They make great leftovers, super good, especially if you're struggling with, um, with a treatment and, and maybe not use a, a chicken broth, use a bone broth that's high in minerals. Okay. There are so many wonderful healthy snacks and I'm just going to cover these uh, quickly. But again, this is how you stick to good habits. You make sure that these things are in the refrigerator so that at four o'clock when your blood sugar is dropped and you're super hungry, you grab maybe some nut balls, you grab some hummus or trail mix or raw veggies with hummus. And, and so maybe the night before you and your family make, you actually make apple chips or beet chips or zucchini chips. I mean, you don't have to just grab a bag of chips. You can have fun with some of these cooking options. Think about frozen pizza. We don't always have to buy pizza, which is getting expensive. So many Italian restaurants or not so much restaurants, but delis or grocery stores now sell the frozen dough. There are people that like to make their own dough, but if you don't have the time, you can buy the frozen dough and roll it out. It's a wonderful family activity. I literally, my husband and I have invited couples over and it's make your own pizza night. So that is a fun way, but you can buy your own cauliflower crust. You can buy, um, you know, just, just healthier options and then load it up with veggies. I love to talk about beverages because really we don't want to drink our sugar. That should be maybe something that we live by. So we're drinking herb tea, green tea, carbonated water. We're making our own juices or smoothies, but to get away from artificial sugars um, and regular sugars. And then lastly, we're going to just talk about sweet treats. And so if you need or want any of these recipes, you can find them online, easy peasy. But you can always reach out to, you know, to Erin and, and then she can reach out to me. Or you can reach out to me directly um, via my contact information and I can send you recipes. But these, you know, like you can make brownies that have that the ingredients are awesome. So they include dates and maybe coconut oil. Uh, they include nuts and seeds. They're super healthy for you. No, I'm going to take that back. They're not super healthy for you, but they make eating a brownie healthier than a box brownie. Okay. Or you can make your own modified ice cream uh, with a banana and almond milk and ice and cocoa nibs with a drizzle of maple syrup and make your own modified chocolate shake. Or in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, I love dried fruit or nut balls, and you can keep those in the refrigerator. And those are great for high school kids. I mean, it just, you can either, the, the, the filler can be either dates or peanut butter, whatever you like. And then cracker alternatives. Have you ever bought a jicama? I mean, who buys jicamas? <laughs> there are these big ball, bulbs, bulbs, and and literally, if you slice them, they're crunchy, and you you can dip them into your hummus. So it's not just all about crackers, but crackers are not all equal. So look at the ingredients on a box of crackers. So um, I just want to thank you. For, and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this, this PowerPoint. And I think we're going to go to Q&A now. I covered a lot of material, but what my hope is, is that I am getting you excited. Oh, I love your sweet kitty. Um, getting you excited about rethinking how you're eating your meals. Are you eating out often? Uh, are you grabbing and going? You know, it's just easier than you think. Well, I'm starving now, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, as, as usual, you have provided us with such incredible information. Um, a lot of questions have come in and uh, I'm sure more will come as we're talking. So um, for our viewers, continue to um, add your questions to the chat. You can email them to us at info at rawfoundation.org. I see that we're approaching the one o'clock hour. Uh, we will be going over because of all these questions. So if you can't stay, know that uh, this will be, uh, this is being recorded 
and we will be sharing it on our social channels and it'll also be converted into a podcast. So if you do need to leave, don't worry, you'll still get all of this great information. So Chris, let's, let's talk, um, you had mentioned about having to have a big budget to eat out every night. These days, you have to have a big budget to eat, right? You know, with, with all the, the costs at the grocery store going up. So what, um, you know, what, where would you focus on spending your money on the, the clean foods? You know, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about where we should go organic. Should we focus on non-GMO products? Like what's, What's your best um, advice for shopping these days? If you're new to cooking, I wouldn't worry about GMOs and organic. I would just start to think about what do I want to eat this week? And, and just even on a, a small post-it note, write down what do you want to cook? And then when you're at the grocery store, what's on sale? So you're focused on what's in, on sale, what's seasonal, what seems to be maybe a little bit more inexpensive, like grains can be more inexpensive, beans can be inexpensive, celery, carrots, some of those common ingredients. And, and just be thinking that way. If, you're, if you are already a cook or you cook a few times a week, you're a healthy eater, then maybe you are looking at organic, but I would encourage you to go to Environmental Working Group, EWG, their website. And they print every year, the dirty dozen. And what they do is they do the research to decide how much pesticides are on certain fruits and vegetables. And so they list out a list that we should purchase organically if we can afford it. Um, usually it's peaches and grapes and potatoes. Um, but again, if you can't, it's go ahead and peel that fruit or vegetable if you're concerned about the pesticide load. Um, but these are the days maybe we can't buy organic, but I wouldn't worry about it. Wash your fruits and vegetables good. Get organic on the, double, the dirty dozen list when we can, but just it's more important to eat well at home than anything. And what, so when we wash our, our produce, what's, is it vinegar and water? What's, what's your recommendation on the best way to, to wash? You know what? It's just, it's just water just getting it, you know, just wiping it really good. But if you wanted to use vinegar, you can put it in a bowl with a cap or two of vinegar and let it sit in there for a few minutes. Whatever you feel that you need to do, if you are, again, concerned about the pesticide load, you can uh, maybe peel the potato, uh, peel the carrot, just make sure that, um, you know, we just have to do the best we can, right, Erin? That's, that's yeah. our motto every day here. Yeah. So let's mm -hmm. talk about eliminating added sugars from the diet. What's the best and easiest way to do that? You know, it's something that I've been wanting to do um, forever, but it seems so daunting. Um, is it going cold turkey or what, what's the best way to, to go about that? It, I would encourage you first to make the decision. Think, okay, this is a new habit for me. And I would look to you to, uh, as we talked about, the goal is to cut back on sugar. The system would be to get rid of a lot of the sugar laden foods in my kitchen. That's got to be a priority, but also looking at your identity. You are a person that wants to eat low sugar. You want to be a healthy eater that doesn't consume a lot of sugar. So the next thing I would encourage you to do is give up all sugar and beverages. We talked about that. It's an easy way to A, cut out the sugar, but think about it. You have one soda, and there are 40 to 60 grams of sugar right there in that, in that cola. Uh, and then artificial sugar isn't any better. So that would be a priority. So it's really a mindful, it's a, it's a way to be mindful of how much sugar am I eating? And really, if we eat like our ancestors ate, cutting out processed foods, cutting out, eating out, we're going to cut back on the sugar automatically. Great. How about, um, you know, we talked a lot about the gut. Do you recommend getting our gut tested to see if there's issues or where things are at with it? There, there's a time and place for that. You can talk to your healthcare professional, talk to your doctor, uh, but you can do some small things at home already. A couple of things like Amy Myers, uh, she's written a couple of really impressive books, Autoimmune Solution, and she talks about an elimination diet. And you can do this at home. You can give up gluten. You can give up dairy for maybe a week or two and start to see how does that, how does your digestive tract feel? 
Do you have less bloating? Do you have less constipation? Start to look at the foods that you're eating. And if you if they seem to be suspect, just give them up for a, a week or so, uh, even a couple of days and see if that makes a difference. Also, look at when are you eating? A lot of us, if we could stop eating at 7 p.m. at night, if you if you start eating for breakfast at eight in the morning, stop eating early so that your digestive tract has a chance to digest the food. So when you sleep, it's not interfering with, uh, you know, with that process. Um, and also don't eat a huge meal really late at night. Um, maybe keep it light. So there are definitely things we can do already to help improve the digestive tract. I just want to say increase with fermented foods, maybe be on a probiotic. There are so many great things we can do already. So we got a question in that says gut health, gut health is confusing to me. Can I drink a kombucha a day and be okay? It's advertised as a fix. So um, if we could talk more about probiotics and kombucha, is there such thing as too much um, fermented foods or too much kombucha um, within our diets? There really are. There really, there, there's a point where it's too much. And there's a point where some people with their digestive tract and their own struggles and challenges can't eat fermented foods the same way maybe you and I can eat it. So you do have to, again, be mindful about what you're eating. When I work with cancer patients, one of the first um, one of the first goals is to maybe journal what you're eating because we have to be aware what are the foods that are causing digestive distress. Remember that when you eat something, there could be a 72 hour transient time. And so what you ate two days ago might be affecting you today and you don't realize it. So for some people, you can take a probiotic, you can take a one serving of Kim kimchi or kombucha every day and you're fine. For other people, it might be more than that. The digestive tract is a little bit more sophisticated than what we have in this time frame to discuss, but um, it's, it's, it's critical to look at. Great. Um, so our, a question just came in that my family grew up culturally eating dinner late. If that's still the norm, do you suggest we eat breakfast later to accommodate? Well, if you're not having or experiencing digestive issues, then maybe it's fine. Uh, but here would be a couple of red flags. One, your, your sleep is interrupted because for whatever reason, you have acid reflux, you have digestive issues. And so in the middle of the night, you, you just have this kind of this irritable bowel thing going on. Um, for that, you would wanna eat earlier. If you wake up in the middle of the night and, and you just feel like you can't fall back asleep. I think digestion needs to be earlier so that the digestive tract can heal uh, and, and help our bodies to heal. So that, again, if you're used to eating late, that's fine. Can I just give you an example? My dad, he's so, he's healthy. He's 88 years old and he came to visit and he said, I eat breakfast at 10, I eat lunch at four and I eat dinner at nine, but I have a lot of acid reflux. And I said, all right, dad, what are you eating at night at night? Oh, that's my big meal, he says. I said, is there any way you could swap the big meal from dinner to lunch? And, and then he said, absolutely. And I said, if that still doesn't work, you've got to shift it. You know, our, I, I don't think we're meant to uh, eat super late and, and digest our foods properly for some people. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. So um, let's, somebody asked what farmed fish means. Can you talk about the, the different types of fish that you could get? Well, I think the gold standard is when we're buying the wild caught, maybe Alaskan salmon. Uh, and the, the reason is, is because what the animal eats is what we are eating. So it's not just about fish, what the chicken is eating, what the cow is eating, that's what we're gonna eat. So if a cow is fed a lot of grains that are inflammatory, that makes the cow sick, all of a sudden the farmer is gonna, you know, pump them maybe with hormones and antibiotics. And then of course we're gonna consume that. It go, it's the same thing with fish. If we can find a source of fish based on, they should be eating what they need to be eating, right? Things in the, in the sea, uh, algae, all of that, then, then that's a healthier option for us. Not always available, of course, 
Um, so you just have to kind of weigh out the pros and cons. So it's kind of I like- think, I, I think too, there are healthier farm raised options available, but we have to do our research. Okay, so so to analogize it, um, the, the fresh caught is, is closest to the um, pasture raised eggs or the grass fed beef. Yes. Okay. And if we can't, if we can't afford that, or if we don't have access to that, um, is caged free eggs or caged free eggs a next, next best option? Or, you know, where should we go on for all those different pieces? Absolutely. An egg is a wonderful source of protein. And um, if that's what we can afford in our budget or it's, it's available, then that's what we need to do. The reason the free range eggs are so healthy is because that chicken, like we mentioned, is out there eating bugs and eating grass and eating all the things we don't want to eat, but it's allowing um, a higher level of omega-3 fatty acids to be incorporated in that egg yolk. If you do an egg study, you can do your own egg study and, and buy a cheaper egg and, a, and maybe a higher priced egg. Now they're all higher priced, right? Unfortunately, but one yolk is yellow, one yolk is orange. But again, going back to we've just... We, this is not about perfection. This is about doing what we can for our families at this time. Love that idea. So mm -hmm. is there a neutral oil that you would suggest if vegetable oil is bad? Um, is canola oil bad too? You know what? I'll, I'll just to defer to the experts and you don't hear a lot about canola oil. I think in the processing, um, it, it, it's not as healthy as an olive oil. Again, you have to, with olive oil, you have to be cautious that you're buying one that has a seal and that it's truly olive oil, right? It's authentic. Olive oil is, you can use pretty much a, all the time when you're sauteing, when you're not getting that food to a real high heat. We don't ever want it to smoke in the pan. And if you do, then maybe use an avocado oil or use an, uh, a coconut oil. But yes, the reason we wanna get rid of vegetable oil is because it's more inflammatory. It's high in omega uh, six fatty acids, and it's just more inflammatory. And many times it's already rancid. And so when we consume processed foods, when we buy French fries out at a, a, a fast food restaurant, they're using vegetable oil, they're using an inflammatory oil. It, it's just not as healthy for us. And that's why making our own French fries is the option if we can. So even making French fries in an air fryer, for example, that's, that's a good option? Yeah, absolutely. Or roasting them. Uh, you know, at 450 degrees, you know, just cut your own sweet potato or your own regular potato. So, you know, and, and, and even if you do buy a bag of frozen French fries and put those in the oven, it's just Dr. Andrew Weil, I love him as an integrative doctor. He said decades ago, try not to buy anything fried out because we don't know the oil they're frying it in. We don't know how compromised it is. Yeah. Unfortunately, it tastes so good most of them. <laughs> um, so let's continue to good taste. Um, yeah. so if you have a sweet tooth and love candy, um, mm -hmm. what, what's the candy that you, what's a go-to? What's okay? When you cheat, what do you cheat with? You know, the gold standard would be make your own if you could, uh, or then at least look at the ingredients. So let's say you're going to a grocery store and you're looking at the ingredients and it doesn't have high fructose corn syrup. It has just regular cane sugar. Uh, that would be an option. Many times uh, a food will, will be a little healthier if it has protein and fiber in it. It, it, it already might be a little healthier option for you. Um, I, I also would say, just think outside the box. Sometimes we're just creatures of habit and we just have our go-to store-bought cookie. We have our go-to store-bought ice cream, think about making your own modified ice cream or, you know, your own cookies at home. I love to make oatmeal cookies. You know, you're using your own ingredients and, and it's, and it's fun or your own muffins. So be thinking about it. The other thing I'd lo love to mention, especially for cancer patients is we just don't want that blood sugar to, to spike. So if you're going to have a sweet treat, maybe eat it right after a meal that you've had protein and a healthy fat. Um, and, and maybe just don't eat the whole bag portion control, correct? And the other thing is sometimes we can look at, let's say dark chocolate. We're buying dark chocolate almonds or something like that. Um, that is a nice option, you know, versus like a milk chocolate. So it's just looking at the ingredients and the options and, and, and what's available. So do you have um, go-to recipe sites or cookbooks that you, that you like that you could recommend? There are many. 
Um, I, I think this is the age of information. So I think when you're Googling um, or looking up recipes, you'll start to find um, websites that use healthier ingredients, or then you just say healthy brownie mix, you know, or a healthy uh, date, uh, a, a date ball. Um, and, and many times it'll pop up. I know Pinterest has a lot, a lot avail uh, available to us, but um, I, I think that it became, it, it, just thinking about it, it becomes overwhelming. Like, what is the recipe? So if you have a friend to share it, definitely reach out to us if you're looking for ingredients. But I just like to throw this idea out to you. If you have, let's say, a magazine recipe or something online and you have the capability to make a copy, maybe just have a, a three rings binder and just start to put a few recipes in there, those go-to sweet recipes that you like that um, you know, you're not just always wondering what should I make because that makes you feel overwhelmed. So, so speaking of making things easy, um, what's your take on meal delivery services? I love them, I love them, but I'll, I'll have to say that I love the meal services that you, they send you the ingredients and you make the meal. The reason is, is because those ingredients are usually fresher. So there are a couple that, you know, that come to mind, but, what I, and I did do it for a couple of months. I do cook a lot. Um, it's my profession. So that's what I do. And I love to do it. But for a couple of months, I ordered in and boy, I wasn't going to the grocery store, therefore not buying all these extra items. I actually was saving money when I was able to just order my three meals for the week. Uh, it comes with a recipe. It might take 20 to 30 minutes, but you've got a a, you know, maybe a TV show or music on in the background, you're cooking with family. I mean, it can become a, a time to de-stress. And now you're making the meal for the family and you kind of learn how to cook. It, you kind of feel like this chef because the spices come with it. So I find it's a very, um, it's a nice option, especially for our cancer patients that don't have a lot of energy um, to cook ongoing or to meal prep or to grocery shop, it all comes in one box. Yeah, I, I agree. We actually do one here. And um, you know what, what we laugh about each time is it says prep time, five minutes and a half hour later, we're still yeah. you know, doing, yeah. but it is nice to, to not have to think about it and to be able to have everything. Let's move on to after dinner and cocktails and alcohol. Um, what's okay, what's better for you? What, what should you avoid? Well, there are many experts that have come out with their recommendation, like American Cancer Society, World Health Organization, that if you're a cancer survivor, maybe just one or two glasses a week. You know, alcohol is, of course, we know is not nutritious and it can spike our blood sugar. The other thing that it does is it, after having a glass of wine or two, all of a sudden, those chips just look so much more tempting, right? So we become, it's just easier to overeat or to eat um, things that we didn't mean to, to, to grab. Um, so in moderation, and with that said, maybe choosing to, to maybe only drink a couple of times during the week. And the off times that you're not having a glass of wine, maybe fill your glass with carbonated water maybe uh, add a lemon or a lime. There are some companies that sell flavored stevia that, that, that actually tastes like Coke or like a, like a Kool-Aid, a berry Kool-Aid. So you can, you can add some, some flavor. So I, I think if, if we are drinking every single night to start to evaluate that practice, that habit and think, okay, how can I replace that habit with something else? Yeah, and there's a lot of new, um, you know, the in thing now are, are all the non-alcoholic beverages that mm -hmm. look like with the with the. So obviously you're chasing out or changing out the alcohol from there, but are you are those more sh um, sugar loaded, typically? Many probably are, but again, give or take. If you're at a party or you're at a restaurant, that would be a great option. And again, you know, I, I still think that in moderation we have to be thinking about that thought process. But all in all. Um, you know, just looking at behavior and are we overdoing it? Okay. So how about, um, so we have somebody who said, I, I recently found out I don't get enough protein in my diet and I don't eat a lot of meat. Um, what can I do? 
So the experts talk about making sure for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that we're having a, a, a serving of protein, which really animal protein would be the back of your hand. It would be three ounces, but we are having a serving of protein uh, at every meal and, uh, and a healthy fat. So we wanna make sure to incorporate both of those things. But if you're doing plant-based, it would really be beans. It would be incorporating more beans, which are high in protein, uh, some of the grains, but you almost have to calculate it uh, and, and be mindful of, of how much. And so you can turn over the package, look at the grams of protein. Many of us eat plenty of protein. We get plenty of protein uh, in terms of living in America, but, um, but for some of us that are exercising, we wanna build muscle post-surgery, we're trying to heal from uh, a cancer diagnosis. We want to just incorporate ways, you know, and one way would be make a smoothie with maybe a protein powder, use a pea protein instead of a whey protein. So there are ways, but you have to be mindful, um, kind of methodical a, a, about it. And are all beans created equal, canned versus packaged? <laughs> You know, I think the gold standard is if you soak your beans, so the dry beans that you soak, but for many of us, we don't have the time. So if you do buy low sodium canned beans, maybe rinse them and a, a, at least a percentage of sodium is going to be rinsed away. That's the way I do it because I don't have time to soak them. Um, but, you know, you just have to, it's kind of give and take. I, I would rather have you get a serving of beans in your diet every other day than no beans at all because you don't have time to soak them. Sure. So let's move on to kids um, and how we could help our kids to eat healthier or branch out a little bit. You know, I have three boys, one eats everything, um, one picks something and sticks with it. And, and the other, it's kind of the flavor of a day. Um, what, what are, what are ways that we could encourage um, them to eat healthier or, you know, get are there clean or healthy um, chicken nuggets or go-to cereals that we could um, get for them? So the first thing that comes to mind is just remember that most of us, especially children, they need to be introduced to a, an, an ingredient or a meal or an item many, many times before they decide if they like it, number one. Number two, their, um, their palate is changing all the time, right? Their taste buds are always you know, changing. And so what they didn't like two months ago, they might like now. Um, so be willing to keep serving the same thing. If they don't like broccoli, keep introducing it, but in different ways in terms of maybe steaming or uh, roasting. It's amazing how just changing up the way we prepare it can make all of the difference. I do think that looking at the label will help you to figure out, is it healthy or not? Does it have protein? Does it have fiber? Uh, are the ingredients, can you pronounce the ingredients, right? So looking at that, but also teaching your kids to cook, to look at ingredients. I think we all as a family need to, to, to come together and, and to be able to identify foods are expensive. Foods are not all healing. We need to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. You, you can definitely have your treats, but what does that look like? It has to be a really loving conversation. And sure, if they want store-bought cookies, but maybe on the weekend you make your own and that's kind of fun. So it, it, that's a class in itself really, but it's uh, something that we have to just, you know, keep talking about. Love that. What's your take on intermittent fasting? You know, the reason I like it is because, again, we talked about it, but to me, you stop eating at a certain time and you allow your digestive tract to heal your body instead of focused on digestion. So intermittent fasting to me is if you could stop eating at seven or eight at night, and then you start eating again at seven or eight in the morning. So just that alone can make a difference. Um, there's all kinds of intermittent fasting. So you have to you have to know what's right for you. Some of us can't do intermittent fasting because our blood sugar drops. We might be hypoglycemic. So you have to really don't just do it because everybody's talking about doing it. Figure out why do you want to do it for yourself? Love that. Can you still do a Mediterranean diet if you don't like fish? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say to that person, you haven't had my fish, okay? Um, <laughs> 
I, I think sometimes people get into their mindset and you might hate fish and that's okay. But for some of us, it's how, how we grew up and we just remember fish was really fishy. Some of the white fish is not fishy at all. And some of the, the ways you prepare it, one of my favorite ways to prepare fish is you, uh, you, you put um, pistachio nuts and parm cheese uh, and create a crust on the top of a white fish. You bake it. It's just wonderful. So I, I go back to, have you had my fish? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> um, so so white fish is, is one of those that are less fishy. Are there other white, are there other types of fish that are, are not so fishy that you would recommend trying then? Well, fish, I'd love for you to, you know, if, if somebody wants to look up some of the healthier options for fish, uh, they're not all equal. Uh, it's not, you know, and there are some, um, you want to stay away from the really big sh fish that have high levels of mercury. So that's a concern. Um, but there are some that definitely taste less fishy than others. Like, what would you say? Maybe like an orange roughy. Uh, you know, there are some that are less, that taste less fishy. But again, it's, it's all about maybe the sauces, you know, the drizzle that you're, that you're going to put on top of it. But, and the other thing is, where do you buy your fish? I think you should buy your fish frozen. I, I was in the habit of buying it fresh, but you know what they do? They take frozen fish and they thaw it and we buy it. And so why not just prepare frozen fish that is, I mean, just immediately the minute that it's captured, it's frozen. So that would be probably a good option. Great. So um, our, our last question, although we could, actually two more questions, <laughs> so we could be talking for the whole day. Um, do you ever work and talk one-on-one -on -one with someone who doesn't have cancer? I do. I do. I actually, um, outside of the Cancer Support Center, I do meet with clients and just gently talk to them about what, what are their obstacles, what are their goals. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. And we'll put your contact information in the mm -hmm. chat so that um, folks can, can get in touch with you. So Chris, what are three key takeaways that you'd like our community to walk away with today? I think number one is just be gentle with yourself. You and I, Aaron, we talk a lot about this, but you know what? It's not about perfection. It's just progress. Food is a big part of our everyday life. Um, it's part of our emotions. It's, it's part of our heritage, our culture. So I think we shouldn't demonize food. We should embrace it. Uh, that's number one. Number two would be, you know what? It's a process and, and to look at ingredients. The, the healthier the ingredients, the healthier the food. And then three would be just look at your habits. And, and again, look at the way you're talking to yourself. And it's, a, it's not going from zero to 100. If you're not cooking at all, just decide, I, I just want to cook one meal a week for my family. And how, what does that look like? And how simply can I do that? So looking at how we're talking to ourselves about cooking and preparing food, because truly an anti-inflammatory diet, we have to think about eating less out, less processed food, less prepared food, and we have to prepare it. Well, thank you, Chris. Like I said, I we could talk for hours and days, and I, I really love every time you come on, and um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of great ideas and, and questions that are going to come in past this. Um, so thanks again for, for sharing your knowledge and enthusiasm and uh, being you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Erin. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too. And thank you everyone for joining us. And my dog thanks you as well um, for joining us and sharing your questions. If you are catching this on the replay, be sure to write replay in the comments and ask your questions so that we could get back to you. And keep an eye out on our social channels for details about our next Wellness Wednesday. And if you have ideas for future Wellness Wednesday topics, speakers, whatever you have, send it to us, info at ralphfoundation.org. Don't forget to mark Saturday, June 10th on your calendar for Dash for Detection. And on behalf of everyone at Ralph Pinkerett at Cancer Foundation, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Until next time, stay healthy and take good care. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.